today. They fought for our country, but they don't want you to see this. I feel like I'm drowning. <laughs> Living in cars. Does it make you feel angry after all you've done for this country? Nowhere to go. It is hard when you are just a single mother, not to mention being homeless. Losing their children. Your husband is fighting you for custody of your three children. How can you fight back from there? American heroes are exposing it all like never before. Next. They are women just like so many of you who are watching us right now. They worry about their kids. They worry about the bills and the laundry and their jobs while trying to also make sure nothing falls through the cracks. The difference is they are trying to do it from 7,000 miles away as they also dodge bullets, live in barracks, and fight terrorists. Now, alarming new reports are exposing a harsh reality that many women face when they come home. It is an issue that you will undoubtedly find shocking, and it demands our attention. Look at this. Today, there are 1.8 million female veterans who've served in the United States military. 230,000 have fought in Iraq and Afghanistan. 30,000 of them are single mothers. And now, female soldiers are returning home in record numbers, wounded and in desperate need of help. We are a system that was set up um, for, for men uh, before there were an extensive number of women serving in the military. That very system is now struggling to provide solutions to problems specific to women. The statistics are staggering. One in three female soldiers experience sexual trauma or rape while serving in the military. One in three. And of those, 80 to 90% said that they never reported the sexual trauma while they were on military status. When we first went to war in Iraq, I think Americans were surprised to see so many women uh, fighting on the front lines. Today, there's an unprecedented number of female vets who are left physically and psychologically damaged. Some experts say VA hospitals are overwhelmed and ill-equipped to treat women. We cannot improve and renovate our women's health care clinics fast enough because the women are coming through the doors right now and we're trying to ramp up our services at the exact same time. Long deployments are wreaking havoc on military marriages. Female soldiers on active duty are three times more likely to get divorced than their male counterparts. And some service women come home to bitter custody battles. Many end up losing their children. And another growing problem? Homelessness is a real issue for female veterans. The number of female veterans has doubled in the last decade. Experts believe there are at least 6,500 women vets living in their cars, in shelters, sleeping on the streets. Female soldiers are two times more likely to become homeless than male veterans. We really see the problem of homelessness among veterans as a national shame. We are all dishonored any time a veteran sleeps on the very same streets that he or she has defended. That strikes me as so true, doesn't it, for all of you too? That we're all dishonored when a veteran has to sleep on the streets. Now take a look at this picture taken four years ago at a September 11th memorial. You can feel her pride today this woman is 32 and living in her car. Food, I like to call it my kitchen. And this has like stuff that I can heat up and eat snacks. The microwaves are very easily accessible all times of night, any time of night. So a lot of my food is microwavable. Alicia is a retired Air Force staff sergeant. She's proud to say she has served in Iraq and Afghanistan and that she worked at the Pentagon. But for a year now, Alicia has been homeless. For the past six weeks, she's been living in a car she rents for $10 a day. I have slept in the most dangerous of places with attacks everything else, so it's very easy for me to sleep any kind of way. We asked Alicia to keep a video diary for a few days. 
about 6.45, woke up because I kind of got a little bit cold, so I turned the car on, got some heat. I'm about to go to um, office store, go to my storage unit, try to get my resume and everything together, go and search for some jobs today. It's 11.34. Um, I'm uh, about to go to the gym. This is where I can, uh, after I finish, take a shower, do my hair, um, put on my makeup. Right now, I'm at the cell phone waiting lot. And I come here because it's close to um, a lot of hotels, and so that if I need to go to the restroom, I can, you know, kind of go in there. This soldier survived the September 11th terrorist attack at the Pentagon. She's watched her colleagues and comrades die. She's risked her life for our freedoms, but now, in her quiet moments in her car, her spirit is broken. The word I have trouble saying is the fact that I'm the fact that I am homeless. The moment I turn the key and I take those blankets out of the trunk. I, uh, I don't know. It hits me. It really does hit me. Thank you for being here, Alicia. Yeah, Is it true that sometimes you don't sleep for days at a time? Yeah. In the car? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how long did you serve? Uh, 10 years. And so when you come out of the service, are you not paid? Do you not get a, a well, salary? Well, um, $700 a month retired pay. But because of some debts that I've had um, mm -hmm. since the war, um, that gets taken out. So, mm -hmm. so the money that you get paid goes to pay all of your debt. Right, exactly. So I'm only getting maybe 200 of that because um, outstanding debts is, is not allowed in the military. Mm -hmm. so you have, they have to take that out mm -hmm. at a rate of 15%. So mm -hmm. it's, you know. So how much do you live on a day? Uh, I live on about $13 a day. Mm -hmm. um, $10 goes to the rental car. Um, and then maybe a dollar or two for whatever. And I, I probably eat off of $1 a day. Why do you look so good? Um, I do my own nails. I do my own hair. I do my own makeup. We're in the car? In the car. Mm -hmm. and, and I did my hair, nails, and makeup in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So when I went into civilian life, it was uh, very simple for me to rise and shine every day, mm -hmm. regardless of what's happening at home. Mm -hmm. And any troop will tell you that, regardless of what's happening. I hear at one point you had housing and you gave it up voluntarily. Is that true? You had housing. You gave it up voluntarily. You gave up the room to a mother and her three children. It might have been different had I not seen the children and the babies and look at them and go back into my room and know that me staying there prevented them from being on the street. And so because they weren't raised in this war, they don't know how to deal with this. So I decided to be on the street and put them in, in the room. Why, why wouldn't I? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We'll have more with Alicia when we come back. Coming up. Here, take a Kleenex here. Alicia faces the harsh realities of homelessness and. What do you tell your daughter? Military moms with nowhere to go now. Everyone's asking, like, well, why don't you ask so and so for help? And why don't you ask this person for help? And it's, 
it's hard to say you're drowning when your mouth is full of water. That's what... I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm drowning. I can't even, I can't even ask for someone to help me. So we're talking to Alicia, who is a former staff sergeant who served, here, take a Kleenex, who served uh, two tours of duty for our country in uh, Afghanistan and in Iraq. And today, she is homeless, living <gasps> in a $10 a day rental car. So does it make you feel angry after all you've done for this country? Absolutely not. It does not? No. I grew up in Washington, D.C around some of the greatest leaders of our time, mm -hmm. surrounded by some of the greatest buildings of our time. And to see and to be influenced by their strength and what they did in the heat of battle mm -hmm. and what some of the great, what Martin Luther King Jr. and all these great men that built our nation, mm -hmm. no wonder. You told my producers, though, that you think that <laughs> some men have a better chance of getting off the streets than women oh, like yourself. Tell me why you think that. Why is it harder if you're a woman? Well, because there's only one women's program. It, when that fills up, there's only 30-some beds. When that fills up, where are we going? Yet men, of course, like they dominate the military, they also dominate the housing situation. But more women are in the military. So we need to accommodate the amount of women. More women are now joining the military, yes, or part of the military, and so there hasn't been the expansion to be more inclusive for women. Exactly. Now, there are more than 6,000 female veterans living on the streets. Many of them are single mothers, like 25-year-old Mikaela. Take a look. Let's go. Oh, mommy. This one's really high, huh? <laughs> My name is Mikaela Montoya. I'm a single mother. I'm an Iraqi war veteran. I'm homeless. I decided to join the military at 17. My grandma passed away. Anything that I guess you would have from a parent, I was seeking it from the military. <laughs> Serving the country, I was proud to do that. In 2002, Mikaela joined the California National Guard. Two years later, she was deployed to Iraq and served as a military police officer at a checkpoint. It was so scary because I wasn't even trained for the things that I was doing. Mikaela's unit was shot at nightly. But she says her worst night was when a fellow soldier threatened to rape her. I think it still affects me, so I carry the knives with me. It's like a security thing. When Mikaela returned from Iraq, she got pregnant. Because she had no one to care for her daughter during future deployments, she was released from service. With no childcare, no job, and no money, she found herself homeless. I was staying with friends and family, and if worse came to worse, the last option was staying in my car. I was in the military for seven and a half years, and I feel like I have nothing to show for it. And I, I, don't, I know that I don't deserve this. Recently, Micaela and her daughter found temporary transitional housing provided by a nonprofit called U.S. Vets. Everything all in one, like this is our bed. That's her little wall. That's pretty much it. Welcome, Micaela. Uh, how did you go from being a military police officer in Iraq to homelessness? Um. I don't know. I went, joined the military because I thought maybe, well, because I knew that I needed that help. You were young and looking for a better life for yourself. Right. Right? Yeah. And after that, I had to get out, and I needed, I looked for resources and programs, and there wasn't any out there that could help me. Mm -hmm. Well, I've interviewed so many moms who are overwhelmed. Some of them are in this audience glad to be away just for a day. 
uh, a lot of overwhelmed mothers who are not homeless. It is hard when you are just a single mother trying to function in the world, not to mention being homeless. How do you do that? Well, I have really good faith. Um, I just deal with it a day at a time, and I know that right now this is something that I'm going through, but it's not permanent. We'll be right back. We'll be right back. Coming up... You are ashamed. Plus, a hero's welcome. Major Tammy Duckworth was piloting an Army Black Hawk helicopter just north of Baghdad in 2004 when it was suddenly hit by a rocket-propelled grenade. It had exploded right against the aircraft, and uh, it vaporized my right leg, um, amputated my left, and blew off most of my right arm. She received the Purple Heart. Back on American soil, Tammy learned to walk on her prosthetic legs and became a high-profile advocate for veterans. Well, I should have died that day in Iraq. I, I don't know how I survived. And I feel that this time in my life is, is bonus time. I, I've been given this great gift. In 2009, President Obama appointed Tammy to Assistant Secretary of Veterans Affairs, the government agency that provides services for veterans. She says it is now her mission to improve the system for both men and women. I feel very fortunate to be in a position where I can help make changes happen. I see it as a real privilege. American war hero Tammy Duckworth is here. Yes, <laughs> uh, I agree. Amen. Thank you, audience, that's great. How is it that uh, women like Alicia and Michaela, who risk their lives for our country, uh, end up homeless? And what is that number of women right now? Well, it's, it's too many. Mm -hmm. It's too many women. So mm -hmm. many things have failed to end up with them being homeless. It means that they've not been able to get a job, they've not been able to get affordable housing, and perhaps there's medical care issues that are not being met. Mm -hmm. and VA is working as hard as we can to catch up. But I'll tell you that one of the things that we've done is in the last 18 months, President Obama has committed a tremendous amount of resources and he wants to end homelessness among veterans in five years. And we're gonna make sure that happens. So. 6,500 homeless female vets. I was so struck by that, that it is a shame for all of us when someone who has served our country ends up on the streets. That they defended. That they defended, yes. yes. It's, it's not acceptable. And, and for these ladies, you know, one of the things that struck me as you were talking was you said these men, I, I grew up around strong men. I grew up around these strong people. You're strong. These women have something. They have strength. They have leadership training. They've defended this country. They deserve better. And we're gonna make sure. But, I, but I'm wondering, too, based upon what you were, you were sharing with us earlier, if there is this code of, I am, if you can defend your country and you can do all things and you can do everything, that to be in a position where you have to now ask for help feels what to you? Why haven't you reached out to ask for help? Number one, I have such pride in my uniform and such pride in... Um, my military service. And everybody is so proud of our veterans. And so, you know, oh, I'm, I'm, oh, this is my daughter. She's in the Air Force or whatever. Such an honor that comes with it. I was willing to drown then to release the public's view of what's going on. Um, I, I... You were ashamed. Yes. You were ashamed. Yes. I don't, I, think, I don't think there's a single person here who's not proud of you right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think, um, and this is, Oprah, this is a, this is a challenge we're, we're facing in VA. The resources are there. But if she doesn't know about it or feels that she cannot access it, then to her, those resources don't exist. Mm -hmm. And so there's a hotline that any veteran can call if they're in danger of becoming homeless mm -hmm. or if they just need a bed for the night, we'll take care of you. 
that does not take away from your service. In fact, we need to give you these services so that you can move on. You're the future leaders of this nation. You led in combat. You're going to come back, and you're going to get your feet underneath you, and you're going to get a job, and you are going to get out there, and you're going to lead this nation into greatness in the future. And I my believe job, that. Exactly. I believe and, that. And so let us help you. Let me, let me just say one thing. Um, where I'm at is awesome as far as the VA is concerned. My problem is there is not enough. You're right. She is absolutely right. You mentioned earlier on, on tape that you'd been sexually assaulted while serving in Iraq. Have you gotten help for that? No. Yeah. Right now, a roof over my head is the number one. Mm -hmm. And I haven't been able to deal with any. How prevalent is sexual assault? I believe that the, the number is one in three women um, in the military have experienced military sexual trauma. And 90% of those have not um, reported it. Do you think, though, Tammy, that the military is a good place for women and mothers? I think it's a wonderful place. It is a place where you get leadership training. It is where you earn 100 cents on the dollar that a man earns. It is equal pay for equal work. <clears throat> so it's a tremendous place for them to have a great start in life or a full career. Well, I understand you also struggle with uh, post-traumatic stress. Is that true? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You can't, how can you not? Yes, absolutely. But my problem is, is that I was surrounded by infantry troops that did this every five or 10 months. And so my post-traumatic stress was nothing compared to their, theirs, but they couldn't report it because PTSD wipes your security clearance. You can't get a job in law enforcement. And most of these infantry troops, that's what their love is, is to protect and serve. So they want to continue their careers in the civilian life, but can't. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be right back. Thank you all. Coming up, military moms losing custody of their children. I was serving my country. I didn't think I was going to be penalized. Perhaps this will help us all relate. Your boss tells you that she needs you to go on a big, important business trip for six months, uh, halfway around the world. You can't bring your children. And while you're gone, you find out you're losing custody of your children. Sounds unlikely, but not for many divorced military mothers who go through this every single day. Meet Tanya. To be in my house without my older son is very lonely. I see all these pictures in front of me, and it's very hard to be here without him. My son and I spent most of his younger years, just the two of us. His father and I split when he was very young, so it was just him and I for a long time. We have a very close bond because of it. My son was about five years old, and I decided to get remarried. I had another son, and then our, our life was complete. Tanya was a sergeant and had been serving in the National Guard for 11 years when she got word she was being shipped overseas to Iraq. Uh, it was very emotional to know that you're going to leave and miss a crucial point in your child's life and is extremely, extremely emotional. Before she left, she needed a plan of action for her sons, who at the time were six months and eight years old. The baby would stay with her husband. She was hoping to keep her boys together, but a judge ruled that her oldest would temporarily live with his father. One thing that gave me a little peace of mind was knowing that when I came home, he was gonna come back home also. And then about a week before I was to come back home, uh, I found out that that might not happen. Tanya received a devastating email from her lawyer saying her ex-husband was suing her for custody of their son. It was like someone ripping my heart out. If I had known what me going over to Iraq was going to do to my family, I would have done everything that I could have to try to get out of the deployment. The fathers of Tanya's sons have asked us not to show their faces on television, so welcome, Tanya. What did the judge uh, rule for you? Um, he said that uh, both myself and my ex-husband were uh, both good parents and had stable homes, but due to the fact that my son had been with him for the 18 months that I was gone, it was in his best interest to just leave him there. And did your son have any say in it? Um, he was only eight at the time, and 
he did have a private meeting with the judge, but that's confidential. Uh, mm -hmm. The judge just said that um, our son expressed that he loved both of his parents. I don't really think that he made a choice. Mm -hmm. And I would never ask him to do that. To make a choice. Mm -hmm. So do you now have shared custody? I, we have joint custody. He joint has custody. physical custody. Yes, physical custody. You said that had you known that losing your son would be a part of the deal that you'd have to make, you, you would have tried to find another way not to be de deployed. But how do you do that? Um, I think the only way I could have accomplished that is, is if I had uh, dishonorably discharged myself, just said, I'm, I'm out, I'm done. Um, but I didn't think that, that I needed to do that. You know, I was serving my country. I didn't think I was going to be penalized. This is Captain Eva Slusher, who serves in the Army National Guard. Eva also faced a bitter custody battle, but in the end, she won. So you took action. What did you do? Yes, ma'am. Um, when I returned, my ex-husband would up. give me my daughter back. Uh, How long were you gone? I was gone for 15 months. Mm -hmm. And I went and filed a motion and uh, requesting that my rights as the custodial parent be restored. When I got to court, it turned out to be a full-blown uh, custody hearing. And um, the judge ruled that, just, just like in Tanya's case, um, we're both good parents, but because of my deployment and Sarah being in her father's home for that amount of time that she was uh, better off there because the military lifestyle is not stable and is not conducive to raising children. Mm -hmm. I appealed it uh, to the Court of Appeals, and my ex-husband then appealed it to the state Supreme Court. And until that was resolved, they would not return my daughter to me. That process took another full year. And how old was your daughter during all of this? She was nine when I left. Mm -hmm. She was 12 when I got her back. You got her back. And I hear that as a result of this ordeal, you then helped pass a law. Yes, ma'am. When I returned home and when my ex-husband first said, not without a court order, I, I didn't take it very seriously. I thought, certainly there's no judge in this country that's gonna take my child away from me because I served to my country. That's, it's insane, it won't happen. And I didn't, I don't guess I took it very seriously. Uh, so when the, the judge said um, that Sarah would be staying with her father, I, I was floored because I really thought that I would be protected. The Service Member Civil Relief Act protects us from, from our employers. Um, if, if I get deployed, I come back, my, my employer has to give me my job back. Um, they also protect our cell phone contracts and uh, lease vehicles and our, our homes and all of these other things, but not our children. And I was really astounded to find that out because I really would have thought that our children would be at the top of that list. So when I found out we were not protected, uh, I, I got with the National Guard Association and some people that knew some things about legislation and they helped me uh, to draft a resolution. And a, a state senator picked it up, and she passed a law in Kentucky to protect military parents' rights in custody hearings. I did assist uh, four other states getting their laws changed. In all, we got four state laws changed. To date, there are 36 states that have changed their laws. We'll be right back. Thank you. Coming up, a mother in Afghanistan struggling to keep her family together in the USA. He just come out and said, you know, I can't do it. If you're going to be gone all the time, you've abandoned your family. Over the years, a quarter of a million female troops have been sent to Afghanistan and Iraq. Right now, there are more than 26,000 there. Many of them are mothers. Imagine trying to manage a family when you're 7,000 miles away. News correspondent Mandy Clark runs the CBS Bureau in Kabul. A couple of days ago, she talked to two soldiers at Bagram uh, Airfield in Afghanistan and filed this report for us. <laughs> Private First Class Margaret Parrish is a 27-year-old mother of three. 
She tells me when she left for Afghanistan in February, her marriage was on the rocks. I kept telling myself, you know, I, you make your bed, you lie. And I was going to do everything I could to make it work. A few months into her deployment during an internet video chat, her husband blindsided her. Finally, he just came out and said, you know, I can't do it. If you're going to be gone all the time, you've abandoned your family, you know, I'm done. Were you shocked? I was hurt. It was like a big slap in the face. She's angry her husband is now seeking full custody, and she feels helpless halfway around the world. I ask myself, you know, am I making the right choices? How are my children going to look at me when they become adults? Are they going to look at this divorce? Are they going to blame me because I left? Nine months into her deployment, specialist Jasmine Williams says for her, the most difficult part about serving in Afghanistan is being away from her baby daughter. We were dealing with getting attacked, getting bombed, going on missions. And all the while I'm thinking about, what's my baby doing? Am I going to make it home to my daughter? When am I going to pick her up? Jasmine is not only stressed about the war, she's going through a divorce as well. She tells me she'll have to start over when she returns home. I'm searching every day for cars, apartments, furniture, daycare, everything. I don't think that I'll be homeless because I'm determined not to be. Margaret and Jasmine are standing by in Afghanistan. We'll talk to them when we come back. Be right back. Margaret and Jasmine join us from their military base in Afghanistan. Jasmine, I understand that you're getting divorced, as we just saw on the tape, and trying to fight a war at the same time. How are you able to get through that? It's, it's really hard. I mean, I just try to pray and keep support around me to, you know, help me get through it. And Margaret, how old are your children? My oldest son is five and a half. He'll be six in February. My second son just turned four in August. And then my daughter is 18 months old. Are you tormenting yourself? As we heard some of that on the tape, are you tormenting yourself about your decision to be there and away from them? It, it's difficult being away from your children at any time. I mean, that, and that's any parent, regardless if it's male or female. Um, but I seriously think this is one of the better choices I've made in my life. Jasmine, when you left, your baby girl was, I understand, she was almost a year. It's been nine months now. What have you missed? Um, yes, I left her as a baby, and now she's walking and talking and dancing. I mean, I'm just missing my baby. So as soon as I get home and get settled, I'm going to get my baby. Going to get your baby. Jasmine, did you think that you would be making the sacrifice of having to leave your child when you signed up for duty to serve? Well, I didn't have my daughter when I first signed up, but I know that, you know, this sacrifice that I'm making now is going to better my daughter's future. Um, sometimes, I mean, as a mother, you just have to sacrifice and do what you have to do to support your kids, and it's a hard sacrifice, but I know I have to do it for my daughter. Well, if your babies and children are watching you right now, what would you want to say to your baby? Jasmine, I'll start with you. Uh, I want to say, Elasia, mommy misses you so much. And always keep in mind that I'm doing this for you. And I love you. Margaret, your message to your children. I just want them to know that all these sacrifices I do for them. I stand up for my country. And I hope that all the examples I set, they see that I'm doing it for them. And I want them to know that more than anything in the world, I love them. Thank you, mothers. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Also, thanks to Mandy Clark and CBS News for that footage. Thank you. We'll be right back. Coming up, a surprise for Tammy the incredible connection she shares with a former guest. I just love what you said to her. That is incredible. 
I was seven months into my tour on the 21st of August in 2004, right outside of Baghdad. Our convoy was hit by an improvised explosive device. I looked down and realized that there's no left hand there. Four years later, it's just like yesterday. I have nightmares, I have flashbacks, my truck, it's gonna blow up. People tend to show up when you come back in the pine box. Yeah. I mean, you tend to get, I mean, people will come far and near to a funeral. Yes. But if you're just laid up in the hospital, uh, okay, you're gonna make it, they'll eventually get around to seeing you. Mm -hmm. And um, little do they know that that's really when you need the person, when you're there, and it's a long process afterwards. Mm -hmm. Well, I he hear that despite losing your arm, you, you, you re-enlisted. You re-enlisted yes. after you recovered. You re-enlisted. Yes. Yes. Well, that was uh, Sergeant First Class Juanita Wilson. She was the first American mother to lose a limb in Iraq. And we recently called her to find out how she was doing. And then while we were putting together the show, we discovered a remarkable connection that Juanita shares with Tammy Duckworth. Take a look. For five days, I was in searing, unrelenting, endless pain that just would not stop. After being shot down in Iraq, Black Hawk helicopter pilot Tammy Duckworth was taken to Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington, D.C. And that's when I knew I was going to die. I, I was sure that I wasn't going to make it. All I could do was just lay there and look at this clock. And I just kept thinking, I can make it 60 seconds. And at one point, this other soldier came in. And she was an arm amputee. And, and she took off her arm. And she looked down at me. And she said, um, I know you're in pain. You're going to make it. And she said, sorry. Can I stand here for you? I still had the dirt from Iraq and the dust and the sand, and I still had the dried blood that was clotted in my, ha in my hair. She said, I'm going to wash your hair for you. And she just radiated this peace, this, this serenity that came out of her. I hung on to that like it was a lifeline. And every so often, I'd turn back, and she'd still be there. And she stood there for five days. I don't know how I made it those days had it not been for her. Well. Amazing. Juanita is here. Come on out, Juanita. Juanita. I just love that line. I just love what you said to her, which is what we all need to do for each other. Can I stand here for you? That is incredible. That is incredible. And you know, it was a coincidence that we found out that you two actually knew each other. When yeah. I think of this lady, I think of two words, warrior and compassion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she did for me that no one else could. Another, took another sister soldier to do it. Did you know that you'd had such an impact on her? No, I didn't. Actually, what happened is um, I just knew that very few females come in, and um, I knew what I had gone through there. And so I vowed that while I was there, whatever female came through, and especially when I found out the condition that Tammy was in, it was my duty to be there to let her know that she could make it. Well, you know, one of the reasons I'd asked my, uh, my team to, tr to try to find you and see how you were doing you said something on the show I never forgot. You said, when you come back, everybody expects you to be the same person you were. And there is no way you can humanly possibly be the same person you were after going into war. And that impacted me so much. And so I wanted to know, how are you now? And have people uh, adjusted to the new you, who you are now? I don't think people have adjusted to me. I think. I've adjusted to people. Mm -hmm. My husband is actually serving in Iraq right now. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm home with my two girls. And there are some days, honestly, I just want to, like, really let down. But I have these kids, and it's somewhere this deep spirit. Um, God is who it is. It, uh, that just enables me to not just zap out on these kids. <laughs> I, I, I'm saying, because 
<laughs> and then, and then <laughs> it's true, it's true. And my husband is calling me from Iraq and he's trying to tell me how to set up Skype. I don't have time for Skype. I got <laughs> kids, the puppy, the house, how I'm feeling emotionally and I have to suppress that just to get through the day. So I, I know that as a soldier serving, you're, it's a constant suppressing how you really feel just to get through today. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Juanita and Tammy. Michaela, Alicia, all my guests today. And to all the servicemen and service women who are fighting for our freedom, we thank you. And as we heard Tammy say earlier, we are all dishonored any time a veteran, male or female, sleeps on the same streets that he or she has defended. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Mm -hmm.